Hello, Afrotech. I'm Aether Williams. I lead strategy, digital, and innovation for Wells Fargo. I'm very excited to be here today at this year's conference because we recognize that this conference brings together the best innovators and tech talent. You are here because you are the drivers of change. And we are honored to be part of this community. I'll be taking questions live at the end of the session today. I'm looking forward to some good conversations. In this session, I'm gonna talk about how innovation is driving transformation in financial services and what skills will be needed to drive future innovation. It's such an exciting time to be in financial services and we're in an era where really anything is possible. I'm responsible for sort of three things that are very interrelated. The first is thinking about our long-term strategy, thinking about how the industry is changing, how technology is changing the industry, how our customers' preferences are changing, and how we position our bank to best meet their needs in the future. Second to that, and related very much, is digital platforms. So as we all know, digital technology, ever going back to when Steve Jobs first pulled that iPod out of his pocket in 2001, things have changed dramatically. And where it's been digital, moving into mobile, uh, that has sort of really changed the landscape. And so thinking about how we better interact with our customers and provide services to them in a very personalized manner on their phones is sort of a key thing. And my team helped drive that effort. Lastly, it's innovation. And innovation is tied into all this, thinking about what's out in that third horizon with three to five years down the road that really can change what's happening today. So whether that's distributed ledger, it's um, in any of its forms, including blockchain or cryptocurrency or stable coins, thinking about how we can think about um, better leveraging artificial intelligence and machine learning to make things work today, or increasingly thinking about climate and all the technologies that have yet to be invented that we should help finance as a bank or invest in to really help our, our clients transition to a more green economy. So those things are part of my world we think about, uh, and that's what I do for the bank. So I would say um, from a pace of change standpoint, the industry didn't change very much at all for most of my career. I've been in banking almost 30 years. And for the first 25, it was pretty stagnant. In the last five or so, it's accelerated dramatically. So if you think about um, the concept of Moore's Law, which applies to technology, it's accelerated way beyond that. And so that pace has driven itself pretty quickly where you see um, because of who's in the industry and how they're approaching solving problems. You know, banks are pretty set up and pretty normal and run on a very regulatory process and very long term. Um, our new competitors, technology companies, work much faster cycles. And that's changed, that's kind of changed the, the pace of what we're doing. And it's also changed how we work. Well, I'd say the last, you know, 18 to 24 months have, with the pandemic, have done a couple things. One, it's dramatically accelerated the rate of adoption of mobile technology. Because people weren't allowed to go to, to branches or financial centers, even though we still had a million people a day going to our financial centers, you know, in the first quarter of this year, I think we had 1.8 billion mobile interactions with our clients. So, the, the, so the, the scale is dramatically tipped towards mobile interaction because people didn't need to go to branches and they realized that, you know, through mobile apps, you can do most of your banking. Unless you need coin currency, there's not much else you cannot do through your mobile app. And so that's, you know, kind of pivoted us to a very mobile first mindset. How do we think about developing for the phone, which is a primary interaction point, and then disseminating that uh, interaction out to our other channels where people do want to talk to someone or meet with someone face to face. So those things do happen and they still will happen and we'll encourage them to happen. But you need to think about it as a connected ecosystem. That's been kind of one impact of the pandemic. The second impact I think is it illustrated um, kind of some, some disconnects in the system. So one of the things that the government did um, through the Small Business Association, they launched a thing called the Payroll Protection Program, which is basically a program to, to issue small loans to business owners who are impacted, shut down, or you know, by the um, by the lockdown orders around the country. The, what you saw is that the big banks, we had the technology and the resources to quickly sort of stand up a program, communicate to people how it was going to work, integrate the SBA systems, and sort of roll it out. The smaller banks. Um, who were in some of the underserved communities didn't have those resources. And so a lot of those communities that didn't get uh, access to capital at the speed with which they really should have and were disproportionately hurt. And so one of the things that we've been thinking about as a bank is how going forward we can fix that. And so how can we either white label some of the massive things we can do um, or partner with technology companies to do things in the cloud that we can they can then on you know, allow other people to subscribe to, to use, so they can continue to do this. We know we can't serve every community um, and every business, but we can help with some of the technology. 
And one of the things we did is we invested in a neobank. So neobanks are, basically it's a technology app that sits over a bunch of smaller banks and allows them to do this. We invested in them both to give them capital, but also to give them access to my team to help them think about how to de deliver their capabilities. And that bank's called Greenwood Bank, which is primarily targeted towards the African-American and Latinx uh, communities. And that's been actually really um, a good partnership to date and we hope to scale that more, more in the future. The digital divide between uh, is real. And whether that's between the socioeconomic groups, um, which is largely also falls around um, ethnic diversity lines, you know, um, the pandemic just illustrated that more glaringly, whether it's from school or in, uh, in business, not having access to technology has been really, really detrimental to many communities, particularly, um, you know, black and brown communities, to be, to be quite frank. The other side of that, though, is what innovation can do is it can make technology scalable and cheaper and more accessible. And so as we think about how we approach um, building things, the beauty of being in a company the size and scope of Wells Fargo is that we can do things at scale. And then we can make things very accessible to a wide swath of people, either directly or through partnerships with others. And I think that um, the scale effects of, of, of companies like ours being more innovative um, will make it better for those communities that have been underserved in the past. Consumer expectations have been changing. Um, it's a generational shift. So I think about the different generations. So you have the baby boomers, so my parents' generation. They were um, very much of a sort of fall in line generation. And also you would say that they had a very, their expectation of service was about personal interaction. So I sit down with my financial advisor, I go talk to the person at the branch and that behavior carries on. You flash forward to Generation Z, which is sort of like my children's generation, kids, you know, teenagers into their mid twenties or the millennials who are now in their thirties, grew up in a digital age. And so interactions may be multi-channel, they're starting to skew towards digital, being pulled by the lot of Generation Z, but also they're hyper-personalized. And so I think about like growing up in high school, I listen to FM radio and you sort of figure out the, the, the station that kind of had the music you liked and you sort of just dealt with whatever the DJ was gonna play. Then that migrated to serious, serious radio where you had stations similar, you didn't have commercials, but you still had the same, um, you have the picks over a genre and sort of you're at the mercy of this. Now you live in a world that's Spotify or Pandora where it's hyper-personalized to you. And the algorithms behind it figure out what you want, how you want it, and serve it up to you. It changed the economics of the music business, but also changed customer, you know, it reflected what customers wanted. I want the music I want to listen to, I want to listen to it. I don't want to listen to what you tell me to. TV is the same way. TV, when I was growing up, was Saturday morning cartoons were on from 7 a.m. To, to noon on Saturday. Now you can stream anything on demand on your phone, wherever you are, um, and you can curate it to what you want. And so customer reputations have gotten to really be hyper-personalized. And I think the company that's done this the best has been Amazon. They've created the segment of one. When I go on my Amazon app, you know, they, sh they show, unfortunately, because my kids use it, I get a whole jumble of stuff. But when you're, you know, if you have a single account, it shows exactly what they think you want, you need, and you want that's relevant to you. And I think that's that reflects where customers are. I think that's starting to now impact financial services. We're trying to think about, all right, what does Aether need? What do you need? And how does that, um, how do we present that to you and give you advice for what you want to do? Not about, hey, buy this or buy that, but hey, you know, we, you told us you're saving for a home. We notice your spending is up this month. You know, are you aware that you're spending $150 on coffee? You know, maybe you want to change that and put, you know, spend $50 on coffee and put $100 extra into your savings so you can start saving for that house. Those sort of things we can do if we take enough information we know about you. The other thing I'd say that's changing is that the, the, the most recent generations, millennials and Gen Z, are, are willing to share much more about their data, about themselves for a return. And so we have to do a better job of capturing that. Older generations, I knew that because I had a 30 year relationship with you and I talked to you all the time and I sort of connected the dots. Now we have a digital footprint of what you do and we need to take the skills available uh, in the marketplace as sort of how we create a digital perso persona of you and then help serve you versus try to sell you. And those are two just a very different shift. Well, I think not carrying cash for me um, forces me to do a couple of things. One, it makes me think about friction in people's lives. So there are certain things you still can't do. So I parked my car this morning. When I pick it up later today, tipping the person who brings the car around, there's no real way to do that unless I can get them to give me their email address or cell phone number and I can send them a payment using Zelle. 
You could do that, but that's still a clunky process and they have to give up personal information they may want onto. So there's still some friction in the system. So basically think about, all right, how do we solve that problem? Um, is there a way to create you know, a tipping app where I can just touch phones and there's no information change, but it moves, you know, moves the money through. Something like that to think about how we kind of get through the, the transactions of people's lives. Um, but not carrying cash is forcing them to do that. The other thing is that um, cash is expensive. It's expensive for um, the system overall, and there's so many better ways we can create value by not using cash. And also, I think about like my my children. They think cash is toxic, and my kids are not. They're not, you know, children. I mean, they're they're teenagers up through with young adults, and they're thinking about like they, cash is toxic. Even cash, they're like, what do I do with this? Like, how can I get rid of this as fast as possible? Because they they live in a digital world, so it's really not necessary. I would say the first thing is is that banking is a is the exciting place to be right now. You know, people think about banks as being sleepy and it is no more. Whether you think about that because of the new entrants and what they're doing or the billions of dollars we can and continually invest in sort of the future, it's a great place to start a career. It touches every part of your life, businesses' lives, um, businesses, how they run, every part of the economy all around the world. And it's changing in every country around the world. And I think um, that's it's a phenomenal it's a phenomenal place to start a career. And technology is at the forefront. In some ways, people think about banks are now technology companies with a balance sheet, versus being you know an old stodgy sort of bank. That would be I'd say number one. And so, if you're interested in careers, definitely look up wellsfargo.com, check out our career site, and and, and um, hopefully you can find a place on my team because I'd love to have you. Secondly, I'd say. Um, the biggest skill set or differentiator for people in banking today versus yesteryear um, is intellectual curiosity and the ability to learn. So things are changing at such a pace, you have to be curious about what's new and you have to be able to learn a new technology. I think about, I've got people on my teams who are coding who are on the fourth language they've had throughout their career because things change pretty quickly. Um, and so now we're, we've gone from, you know, you've gone from C++ to Java, and now you're in coding in native mobile apps, which is a completely different environment. But people who love that challenge of learning new technologies and keeping their skills sharp do really, really well. And so that's, that's a key thing. And then lastly, I'd say people who can think differently, who have different experiences, who are gonna bring a different point of view to the table. Uh, because of who they are and what they've seen in their experiences, that's really valuable because the world is more diverse than it's ever been. If you look at the results of the last census in the United States, the world is more diverse than it's, you know, the country is more diverse than it's ever been. And so having people that reflect that of our clients, whether they be business owners or individuals, is really, really important. It's one of the reasons I've, I was important for me um, to be in financial services, but also for me to talk to you today to tell you that you know we, we, we value your different perspectives. And it's really important to, to me and my team and the efforts of the bank to reflect our clients and, and reflect the country because we are largely a US bank. So it's really, really important. So those would be my three key takeaways for the group. Our recruiters from Wells Fargo's technology, digital, and innovation teams are here to meet with you in the virtual recruiting booths. And our hiring managers are here as well. Come meet with us. We'd love to talk with you. To wrap this up, the way we deliver financial services to consumers and businesses today is rapidly changing, driven by how we innovate the use of data and new technologies. We are focused on how we can deliver new experiences that are secure, seamless, and personalized for all of our customers. And I can't wait to see how innovators like you will play a part in how we evolve.